Good morning, people. <laughs> can we please take our seats so that we can have Catherine share her wonderful work with us? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give a quick introduction to Catherine Lutenegger, who's here with us from Switzerland. Uh, she is an exhibiting artist uh, for Chennai Photo Biennale uh, Second Edition. Her work, her beautiful work, Kodak City, is uh, being uh, exhibited at the Government College of Fine Arts. You must go check that out. Catherine is also doing a residency here in Chennai. She's been here almost a month now. Yeah. And uh, she's making some amazing work over here. Uh, hopefully, we get to see that maybe sometime. You will see it today, actually. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Yes. <laughs> OK. So just to give you a quick background, Catherine Lutenegger is a visual artist based in Switzerland. And she has won many, many, many awards. I'm going to skip the whole awards list. Uh, I'll speak a little about her work. Uh, the Kodak headquarters were founded by George Eastman in Rochester, New York in 1888. In its prime, Kodak employed thousands of people and turned Rochester into a wealthy town. After the digitization of, photo digitalization of photography, the business declined. Catherine's uh, Kodak City series reveals what remains of Kodak as a business and the ways in which the decline of the company impacted the city of Rochester. It is a testimony that is both engaged and objective, covering a part of America's industrial heritage that faces inevitable disappearance. I'm going to let Catherine talk more, and uh, lovely to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you, Suchi, for this wonderful introduction. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all for being with us today. I'm very honored to be here at the Goethe Institute. Uh, th big thanks to Helmut, to the CB CBC team for uh, having me here for the second edition of the festival. I'm very honored to be part of this adventure. Before I explain my project I'm show showcasing here, Kodak City, I wanted to go back to an earlier body of work I've been, I've been doing in Switzerland while I was a student, a student at the University of Art and Design in Lausanne. So this body of work was actually my diploma work. When I started uh, to, to study photography, the first digital cameras came out. And from that moment, I was wondering what would become, uh, what would change for the photographer's practice, what would become of the laboratories. So I decided to visit different photographer studios, uh, beginning by um, scouting my town, Lausanne, in Switzerland. I visited different kind of photographers, could be uh, people, people, photogra people photographers or still life photographers. My intention was to uh, make also a survey with them to question them about the future of photography, how they would see their practice in photography with the upheavals of, digital, of the digital uh, revolution. And I was quite surprised when I was visiting these different studios that uh, the shift was not uh, yet visible. I mean, even if the, if the digital cameras were already in the market at that moment in 2007, um, you couldn't really see the difference uh, from uh, the traditional photography era and the new era. I shot this series uh, with uh, an analog camera with the uh, with Mamiya 6 uh, 7 and my idea was really to keep the places empty and uh, by, by this uh, way showing the photographer's uh, interior, sho showing the photographer personality throughout his objects, throughout his space. I wanted also to give a more intemporal uh, feeling to my pictures so that we don't really know when they were taken. 
And for me, the idea was also to invite the viewer in this in these studios where you're not uh, often uh, granted access to make the people realize what is the construction around a picture. What is the material that is used? What are, what, what are the accessories used to make a picture? I was also quite uh, impressed by the the capacity of each photographer to find a way uh, to uh, shoot their subject, just like this picture. Um, it was interesting to see how this photographer created this atmospheric uh, background just by using a plant and uh, a backlight behind the plant to create this, uh, this, uh, this sky of, 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 uh, of clouds. So my intention was really to cover a bit uh, all um, to cover the older practice in, in, to, in photography in 2006 to 2007 with this idea of uh, showing this uh, singular transition in uh, the history of photography. So the second part of this first body of work was obviously the visit of different laboratories. I visited places where we would do enlargements, analog prints, and I also photographed places where you would process your film. And here the shift was much more visible. Uh, I had this feeling that every places I was going to was almost about to uh, close. So for me, this project was also very important because I had the belief uh, that uh, there was an emergency to document these uh, places about to disappear. In Switzerland, we had the headquarters of the big company Ilford. I'm sure you have heard about it. And I also photographed the Kodak company already in Switzerland. But here already the um, constraints were big. I, the, the only picture I was able to take was uh, this outdoor, outdoor picture. They were not really uh, willing to have a photographer uh, showing the decline into their, into their office. Throughout this first body of work uh, made uh, in Switzerland between 2006 and 2007, um, I had the opportunity to do a solo show in Lausanne at the Musée de l'Elysée, created by Bill Ewing and Nathalie Erjoffer. And through this uh, solo show, I had the opportunity to, to make uh, a book, the first book uh, I've ever published. Its na the name is Orchamp, Out of Screen. And through this book, I won several prizes. One was a residency program uh, in New York for six months. And my idea for this residency was to go on with this idea of exploring photographer studios and obviously going to the mecca of traditional photography in Rochester, New York, which is Kodak Corporation. These are a few selections of uh, pictures I've been taking in, um, in the New York studios. And here, as you can see, you, 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 uh, you have people in my picture. Um, what I've realized in New York is that um, when there is a, sh a photo shoot going on, it's not about one photographer and one object. Usually, it's uh, a whole team. Around, uh, around the shooting. And here I had the opportunity to um, attend a photo, shoot, a photo shoot with uh, Beyonce Knowles. She was posing for American Vogue and the photographer was uh, Henri, Henri Ludwiller, a Swiss photographer who decided to leave Switzerland and make his career in New York. Then I had also the opportunity to visit um, a studio where they use uh, one of the biggest 
Polaroid camera in the world. I think that there are only seven of them. And here it was actually a photo shoot for David Leventhal, who is doing this uh, very uh, precise, very uh, dramatic uh, picture of uh, figurines. Here you can see the different uh, Polaroid uh, picture of the figurine they were shooting. I also had the opportunity to to attend the shooting with Lois Greenfield, a New York photographer who is uh, shooting mostly dancers in the air. In New York, I had uh, this uh, new challenge to shoot people in my in my picture when I was in Switzerland. Mostly, I was visiting still life photographers, or you know small uh, small studios for everyday for everyday people uh, in new york i wanted to show this uh, maybe more uh, uh, fashion more uh, star uh, aspect so uh, my idea was really also to have the people in my pictures after this exploration of the new yorker studios i decided to make my way to Rochester um, with the intention to see how the biggest manufacturer of film worldwide would deal with the technology, with, with, would deal with the, with the digital technology. When I was in New York, I remember that the first uh, iPhone came out in 2007. <laughs> and from that point, I had the feeling that something would radic radically change in the, in, 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 photo in the market of photography and it was really timely to go to Rochester and see how the biggest manufacturer of film worldwide was dealing with this. I firstly took some views from the city of Rochester itself. I, I was actually quite struck w once I arrived in Rochester by the emptiness of the city. It was really like miles away from what I had just left, you know, Manhattan with all the people working. Uh, Rochester was totally different. It was also another facet of uh, the United States. And for me, this, this trip was important also to understand a bit better uh, the context of uh, America, the context of uh, these um, industries um, being uh, on the decline and affecting, affecting uh, also uh, a whole territory around it. When I arrived in Rochester, uh, I was also quite struck by the Kodak headquarters. As you can see, the tower is uh, predominant in the landscape, and it has been this way for many years. Uh, after, um, uh, after, after this tower, then there, there were other high, scrap high, scrap high scrapers that have been built uh, in the financial district of uh, Rochester, but, but before that, it was, it was this, this tower that was dominant in the landscape of Rochester. I had the opportunity to visit the Kodak headquarters. This is uh, the lobby of the headquarters. And there again, I was quite struck a bit by this uh, feeling that time would have stopped in, uh, in this interior of, of Kodak. I had the feeling that uh, everything was still for many years. I had also the opportunity to meet uh, some Kodak employers named uh, as Kodakers, because when you work for Kodak, you're not just an employee working for Kodak, you're really part of the community of, of Kodak, so you, you would be called Kodaker. I also took some details from the 
from the city of Rochester that were a bit depicting my uh, mood <laughs> at the time and also a bit the, the general mood of the city. I mean, one could really tell that uh, this city uh, has been very vibrating, very strong at some point, but the decline was already, already very visible. I mean, the Kodak, uh, the Kodak car park was a good exa example to give a metaphoric uh, image to what, what was going on. At its peak, uh, Kodak used to employ more than 70,000 people only in Rochester, and this number declined uh, to less than 10,000 in just a decade, which is an enormous uh, re re uh, restructuration. I was also curious to see where uh, the film I was using were made in a way because you know everybody knows about Kodak it's a huge brand but I thought that there there was a, there was just a few attention paid to the city where actually these uh, films were made During this exploration of the Kodak City and the Kodak Industrial Park, I was quite constrained uh, in, um, in my movement. I mean, I couldn't just go anywhere I wanted in the Industrial Park. I was always followed by someone from Kodak because they were really uh, uh, very anxious that I would give a bad image of the company. So throughout this limitation, I also decided to change a bit my first ID on the project. At first, my ID was only to shoot inside the Kodak buildings, inside the Kodak Park. And finally, I decided throughout these constraints to show this decline maybe in a more subtle way by showing the reflection of the decline in the city itself. Here uh, are a few pictures I was able to take in their control room where they control the production of the film. Films are produced uh, in uh, rolls of this, uh, this size uh, and then they are cut in different uh, dimensions. I also wanted to shoot the surroundings of the Kodak Industrial Park because also as a foreigner I was quite struck by the urbanization of this city, the way the residential areas were so close to the industrial areas. And here in this picture I wanted with my camera, with the with the perspective to combine these two different areas together. This uh, exploration in Rochester uh, happened in 2007. I've, I was there two weeks and then I decided to return there in 2012 when they announced officially their bankruptcy. I thought it was really like the last chance to finish this story, to finish this record of uh, Kodak City. And in with this uh, five year gap between these two travel, it was interesting to see what had changed and what, uh, what didn't change. And when I returned in Rochester, I was also like more focused on what I wanted to shoot uh, to finish my project on it. 
I also had the opportunity to go into the industrial park without passing through the official uh, official way, which uh, allowed me to go deeper also in my project during the second trip. This one was actually in the in the Eastman Theater. It's not really in the, in the Kodak Park. They have also a big auditorium in the Kodak Park, but this picture was taken in the city of Rochester, and the name of the, of, of the place is the, is the Eastman Theater. Here, again, I didn't get the official authorization to take a shoot inside, and this, the story behind this picture is really that I just entered uh, uh, by uh, at the end of a show, I just entered uh, as uh, as if I was just going to the toilet, <laughs> and then I make my way to the to the auditorium, and uh, I took this uh, picture quite quickly because I was not authorized to be there. But I thought that this uh, emergency light was just perfect for my story, so I was happy to have managed to do this picture in the end. While I was in Rochester, I, I also take some time to visit the George, George Eastman house, which is uh, the house where the founder lived, and which is also one of the oldest institutions for photography in the world. They have a huge archive for photography, and besides, you can really visit the house as if uh, George Eastman was still alive. <laughs> This is a portrait of George Eastman, the father of modern photography. He had his dream of uh, bringing photography to the people, dec democratize the, the medium, with this slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. He really achieved his goal in a way. Um, and we don't. We, we actually don't know so much about him, and this project for me was also a, pay, a, a, a way to pay tribute to this man who changed completely the history of photography. And I will just finish this uh, presentation of Kodak City with uh, this uh, story about him. Um, at the end of his life, he he was very ill, ill, and he would uh, spend the rest of his life on a wheelchair and has, he was always dedicated to, to this company. He, wouldn't, he didn't want to spend the rest of his life on a wheelchair, and he decided to commit suicide in his house. Just by, and just before that, he left a note saying, to my friends, my, wor my work is done, why wait? And as a transition to the work I've been doing in Chennai, I will just play this video that I've been also showcasing here at the Chennai Photo Biennale. In the century, the Eastman Kodak Company has been part of our lives, our memories, and our futures. Continually pioneering technologies that make the process of taking pictures easier and the results remarkably better. Allowing us all to share the precious moments we treasure, the benchmarks of our lives with those we love. In fact, many of us fondly refer to those special times as Kodak moments. Kids growing up, it's the very synchronizing. playing in boxes, elderly people blowing out birthday candles, daddy's little girl becoming a blushing bride. Gets you misty, doesn't it? Yep. They shovel the schmaltz on pretty thick. But that kind of crap doesn't work anymore. People want the latest digital things. More power, more features, wireless contraptions, innovative ways to bring their pictures into the 21st century. Well, guess what, bucko? Kodak is doing it. 
You thought they were just hiding out, waiting for this digital thing to blow over, didn't you? Oh, sure. For a while, they were like, oh, there's no way digital's going to catch on. Hell, 20 years ago, they pawned the first digital camera off on Apple, who marketed it with all the grace of an anaconda devouring a live chicken. Yeah, if only it had come in more colors. But now, Kodak is back. They're taking this digital thing to a level undreamed of. Pioneering technology that'll redefine the digital revolution. I know, big talk coming from the company that unleashed Advantix onto the world, right? Well, turn down your mini-disc player, fire up your Newtons, and listen up, because they're not playing grab ass anymore. They've got things in their research labs that'll make biometrics look like a Happy Meal toy. I'm talking facial recognition, GPS-enabled photography so my camera knows where it is, pictures that learn and group themselves into stories. We're talking meta-knowledge. Cameras that automatically enhance the color of the grass because they know it's grass. Try and patent that. Oh, do that. <laughs> and what about sharing? I'll tell you about sharing. All your friends and family will be emailing their pictures wirelessly to you and sending pictures of Grandma's birthday to your phone and uploading shots of the dog wearing those big stupid sunglasses to your PDA. And they're going to be everywhere because now you won't have to be a Navajo code breaker to use digital. And they're all going to look like freaking any living would shot them because they'll automatically adjust the lighting and the composition for you. No more flash problems, no more red eye. How's that for advanced? Booyah! You know what the best part is? They're going to turn the schmaltz back up to 11. Oh, yes. People will have their Kodak moments again. They're going to bring back all those damn pictures of the cute puppies and the cuddly kittens and the cooing babies and old folks in party hats and dads crying and that the doe-eyed kid, you know the one. They're bringing them all back, all in the same spot. And it's going to be 15 minutes long and James Cameron will direct it and Celine Dion will sing the theme song while riding along on a unicorn through a field of baby animals under a big blue sky. And there's not a damn thing you can do to stop it. You were a Kodak moment once, and by God, you'll be one again. Only this time, it's digital. Oh, yeah! There are a lot of people here from the surrounding neighborhoods. This thing has been all over the local news, and Kodak's been hinting that there's something big planned. So let's check it out. I've never seen anything like this before. That's the truth, but I really haven't. This is amazing. But a lot of good relationships. Relationships that are still together today, performed in that building. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all on this gorgeous, sunny day in Rochester, New York, to this very unique moment in Kodak's history. It's also exciting to be a part of another revolution in imaging. I will stop it here. <laughs> um, I didn't take, I didn't shoot these videos. Uh, it's only footage videos I found on internet. Actually, these videos were taken shortly after I was uh, in Rochester in 2007, 2007. And I was quite struck when I saw these uh, videos because they kind of turned this digital revolution into something so entertaining, you know, in a way. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the people you can see in the video uh, cheering these implosions, they are certainly not 
Kodak employees. They are just like, I guess, neighbors uh, that, are, that wanted to see this show. Actually, Kodak hired this uh, man you have seen at the beginning of, of the video um, to present it, to make it like more entertaining for everybody in a way to make the pill uh, uh, go uh, <laughs> better <laughs> through the throat. I don't know how to explain that, but it's a way of uh, staying positive about something that is very negative for an entire city. To show you some pictures have been taken, not in Chennai uh, yet, but in, uh, in Switzerland and in, uh, in, um, in China for my project on 3D printing. Hold on. After having depicted the decline of traditional photography, <laughs> I was really willing to go on a new project that is more prospective in a way. And um, I, wanted in a, I wanted to explore the possibilities and limits of 3D printing in different fields. So I started again close to my house in Lausanne by collecting objects from different companies using 3D printing. At first, for this first chapter of this project named New, Artifici uh, New Artificiality, my idea was to collect objects that failed in the process. Here you see some cross-section of human busts. It's like tests before you would do an entire bust of a figurine. And I, I was quite uh, fascinated by the quality, the texture of these objects. It's, it was for me like a new aesthetic coming out from, the, from a machine and from a technology. And in a way, I had this feeling that it was maybe in the, um, in the extension of, of my previous body of work, uh, in the way that, um, you know, with digital photography, everything tends to be uh, dematerialized, seems, seems to be virtual, we don't touch photographs anymore. And I thought that maybe 3D printing would give us a new opportunity to touch images in a way, because in the end, a 3D printed object, ob uh, 3D printed object comes from many different 2D objects, uh, to, uh, 2D images put together. As you can see here, you see the different layers that um, make this orange. And I was also quite fascinating, fascinating, fascinated by uh, the fact that with a 3D model, you can go in, in, a, in, in any scale. I mean, if you have the 3D model, you can print in small or in big. Of course, then it's the limitation of the machine. But in a way, for me, this uh, technology was like opening really new uh, opportunities, new possibilities. These are a few installation, installation views I did in Switzerland with this first chapter of the project. I also made my own figurine in a, in a 3D printed, printed sculpture. And after this first chapter, I was wondering what was the biggest thing that we can do so far with the, the technology of 3D printing, and I came across a company named Winson, uh, uh, based in Suzhou, in, uh, near Shanghai, and I photographed the buildings they are actually producing there with a 3D printer. This is uh, the biggest um, building you uh, existing so far made ever made with a 3D printer. It's a five-story uh, building. The idea behind 3D printing in the construction industry is that you would also go uh, towards more organic shape in a way. 
And of course, the idea behind is that you would be able to produce uh, housing for uh, uh, for a lower price and in a quicker way. This is an installation view of this uh, second chapter I did in Suzhou. And here I'm also playing with the scale again uh, by having big enlargement in the space and playing with the perspective of the, of the venue and the, the perspective of my own pictures. The third chapter is about what would be harmful for the people. Uh, I mean, all the objects you can also imagine to produce with this technology, such as uh, firearms. In the US, there is a big issue uh, with, a na with a guy named Cody Wilson that would like uh, everybody to have uh, um, the uh, opportunity to print out a gun. <laughs> so he was really willing to put online the different uh, 3D model uh, um, um, pieces uh, to create its uh, one's own uh, gun at home. And here, what you can see is uh, some uh, tentative, some, uh, some, um, some replica of firearms that failed in the process, showing also that we are not yet uh, ready to get this done, I mean, it, we, we will need some time to, to, perfect, to, to have the technology democratized and, and, um, and uh, perfect. But this time may, might be very short and through that project I'm also a bit uh, like warning uh, the people that uh, this might be also uh, very, very dangerous for, uh, for, for us. Another chapter was to photograph things that are 3D printed for the med medicine purpose. In Switzerland, we have big names of pharmaceutical uh, company, and I photograph different products they do with the 3D printing technology. They are already able to do graphs for regenerative medicine. With they are able to produce artificial artificial bones prosthetics and pre-op uh, pre uh, 3D printed objects to help the, the doctors to, um, to prepare their operation. So this project is still ongoing. Um, with the opportunity to be here in Chennai, I wanted to go on with this idea of, uh, of, the p of exploring the possibilities we have uh, with a 3D printer. And I've, I've been visiting, um, I've been visiting different companies uh, here in Chennai using this technology. As a first, as a first stage, I started to visit these companies. One of them, I mean, it's not really a company; it's a it's a startup uh, of uh, IIT, the Indian Institute of Techno Technology, that use uh, a 3D printer to produce um, small construction. I mean, it's small comparing to what I've seen in China, but it's already like the biggest one in uh, India which is a great uh, breakthrough for them, and uh, it was great to have the opportunity to meet uh, these people of, of, the st of this startup. I've also photographed uh, objects I found in different places here in Chennai. And then I turned my g 
gaze uh, on the cinema theaters because before I arrived here in, in Chennai, I've heard about Hollywood cinema, about uh, all these mat multiplex you have here, and I wanted to to shoot them in a way that is maybe not uh, the standard way of uh, seeing them. You don't see the screen actually, but you don't see you you see uh, more like the atmosphere. I was quite impressed uh, how uh, personalized this uh, theaters are. I mean, in Switzerland, it's so it's it's so standard. Most of the time, th they look the same. All these screens, and here I was quite impressed by the variety there is uh, in these cinema theaters. These pictures were taken in the multiplex of the Escape Cinema here in Chennai. So it's just one place and it's all, all different, you know. All screens are having this different atmosphere. And then <laughs> uh, I wanted to meet these guys that want to be uh, the next uh, big name in the Hollywood uh, cinema industry. So I've been to uh, a theater school and I've met uh, some young comedians there. And I tried to shoot them with this same spirit of Hollywood movies. I just asked them to um, improvise in front of my camera and really trying to give all this expression that I used to have that, that we are used to have uh, in these Hollywood movies and I was <laughs> pretty much impressed by the variety the possibilities from one person uh, to render this uh, expression I really sh shoot this picture uh, in their school so I I really like worked with the with the with with the what I had uh, on site. I brought, of course, uh, some lights, but then I mean I didn't say anything about the way they sh they should dress themselves or or uh, I didn't tell anything about the props. And I like also this aspect that it was very spontaneous in a way. And at the same time, very honest. They don't have any makeup. They they were they they were just like the way they they were, <laughs> and I just let them themselves express uh, in front of the camera. For this project, I brought here um, a print already because what I thought would be interesting uh, was that the final form was not only a photograph but that would be also a combination with painting because I've realized that here it's still a huge craft. I mean, it's uh, very common to find painted um, painted portraits and uh, for this uh, series of uh, young actors my wish was really to make this collaboration with uh, some local painter and here I had the chance to work with the uh, students from the government college of fine arts and they expressed themselves on my on my picture Here you have uh, other ones with a different paper. I like also this idea of having in the end a unique piece, you know, photography is something reprodu reproducible and here the intention was uh, also to get something that is unique, that has uh, the aesthetic of uh, one th one's whole author. Besides, <laughs> I've been also exploring uh, 
Marina Beach, and I know that this place has been photographed many, many, many times, and I tried hard to find a way to shoot uh, this place, and I came across these uh, faces, these uh, patterns on the food um, carts, you know, these um, banners they use to protect them, and I started to collect uh, heads, uh, collect garments, collect um, patterns from these uh, different uh, banner flex. I was very uh, uh, intrigued by the material, sometimes giving the impression that the portrait m is uh, actually a virtual glitch. So I was also playing a bit with the perspective, with the angle, to get, get this feeling that um, this might be photoshopped instead of uh, found on, side, on site. And then lastly, I didn't want to leave Chennai without going to a photo studio. <laughs> so I've been to uh, two different photo studios. I was really willing to see how uh, photographers in Chennai work. And uh, I had this idea of uh, photographing the empty space without the photographer and with the photographer and of course uh <laughs> having this exchange with the photographer photographing me <laughs> this is it <laughs> thank you <laughs> Do you have any questions? Uh, you have <coughs> excuse me, you have concentrated only on Kodak company, but what about other companies that have declined in the same manner? Uh, of course, I could have gone on uh, with uh, documenting all the brands uh, like Agfa, Polaroid, uh, but I really wanted to concentrate in a way on the biggest manufacturer of film worldwide, which is Kodak, because they had this uh, century of dom um, dominancy on the market. And for me, I mean, they were the, the biggest and I, I wanted really to, to go there because f since I, I studied photography, I, I, also, um, I also used um, these Kodak films and I had like a more intimate relation to the Kodak brand than the other brands. But there are other photographers who did also um, a documentation of the decline of other brands, such as uh, this Canadian photographer, Robert Burley and uh, Michel Campo as well. Any other yeah. questions? Hi, Catherine. Thank you for showing your work. Um, I wanted to inquire about, um, see, when, when, there's this, uh, when you're doing the Kodak City, the project, which has this very old school and very, you know, there's this charm about it. And then there is the 3D printing one, and they're kind of like polarities, you know, almost, where 3D printing uses plastic, which does not degrade, it's not biodegradable. Mm. So I'm trying to understand how do you manage with these kind of polarities? Mm. I think that uh, for me, um, the connection <laughs> I see between the two projects is really like this, um, materialization. Kodak was about uh, to have real prints in the end, you know, you would develop your film and then you would 
get your print that you would put in, a, in an album. And uh, the 3D printing for me, okay, there is the use of plastic, it's in another material, but at some point uh, the final form is a tangible object. So I, I, I don't see them as completely opposite in a way. Starting this new project on 3D printing was also for me uh, a question I asked myself if maybe someday instead of taking a portrait, you know, a selfie of oneself, we would maybe just go to a 3D printing studio and have one figurine of oneself because it's a unique piece and then you give more value to this uh, figurine instead of all these snapshots you may have of yourself. Any other questions? No? It's quite <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, even uh, when I shoot sometimes, uh, it, uh, it depends on a negotiation. And especially when you're shooting in places which do not want you to cover uh, and show the frailties, the the stuff that they don't want to come out, you know? Yeah. And with Kodak City, it was definitely a lot about that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand, how did you navigate those corridors? How did you kind of still manage to convince uh, people to have, to have you around? Otherwise, they'll like push the photographers far away, you know, and uh, not let you enter, not let you talk to anybody. Uh, how did you, was that a lot of research or finding certain alternatives or uh, can you share a little bit about your yeah. process? Well, um, at first I had some contacts, you know, at Kodak and I quickly realized that it was not enough to go to the places I really wanted to, to go to. Um, so I... I really need, needed some time to meet people in Rochester, then to get these other uh, possibilities to enter this empire. So it really took time uh, to get this privileged access. As I said, maybe during the first uh, tr trip in Rochester, I was uh, pretty much uh, always uh, following their rules, <laughs> their uh, um, their restrictions. But then, uh, during this second trip to Rochester, then I had already uh, encountered other people working at Kodak, and through them, I was able to make my way in this uh, huge empire. Anyone else? What I wanted to add is um, also that my project was about uh, this question of the durability of the medium, of the final form. I mean, it's very paradoxical nowadays. We are producing uh, so many pictures, but in a way they, they, uh, they are just uh, vanishing in our screen. And throughout um, this project uh, on Kodak, my idea was also to question a bit our relation to to photography nowadays and also this uh, short distance we have uh, on the digital medias. Maybe um, in 20 years we will not be able to read anymore all the pictures we are producing today. I mean, now our pictures, they are just codes, they are just uh, um, algorithm. Um, we have much more uh, knowledge about the analog film and I'm really wondering what will happen uh, of all these image, digital images we are producing nowadays. Helmut, you want to say something? He's here yes. if you want to have a look. <laughs> yes. And if you want to have a closer look, to the portrait I've, I've showed to you, please uh, come here. <laughs> yes. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, well, thank you. Here with <laughs> us.
Uh, we have Catherine's book, Codaxity, that is available for purchase outside. It's sorry? Oh, it'll be a literary society today. It's over. Oh my God. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's already over. <laughs> Too bad. All right. But you can uh, come and see me, and yes. uh, I, w I, w I will arrange something for you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we are already sold out. But thank you so much. It's uh, like almost like going back in time uh, to where you know it all began in a way, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how we are, and what all you've been exploring. Can you maybe quickly just share with us your experience in Chennai, not just about yeah. what you've been shooting, yeah. but uh, what you felt in terms of maybe, I don't know, the studios that you've been visiting mm. and the digital media, the whole intervention and, and the explosion yeah. of <laughs> digitalization? Um, well, I think that uh, since I'm here, uh, I'm seeing things uh, being done in so many different ways that what I'm used to. I mean, it was very inspiring <laughs> for me to visit these photographer studios and see the way they work. You know, when you have to shoot someone, you need maybe to direct the person, for, uh, for example, and when there is a barrier in the language, how do you deal with that? And uh, during this session I did with this photographer, uh, he started first to shoot me, and what I liked is, uh, you know, with that even if there is a barrier with the language, you can still find a way to communicate, and he really wanted me to smile, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because for him, a good picture is a smile, and and he he did this movement uh, to make me smile, like smile, <laughs> smile. <laughs> and since I'm here, I mean, I'm, I'm observing all this, you know, this uh, um, this uh, um, body language, this uh, faces language, and for me, it's really overwhelming. I mean. I'm sure that we'll come back in Switzerland with uh, some reflex of, uh, you know, of body language because I, uh, when I travel, I'm like a sponge and uh, I think that... Do you not <laughs> smile in Switzerland? Uh, no, I don't smile so much. <laughs> and okay. usually when I shoot people for my uh, assignments, my portrait assignment, I try to avoid to make them smile because it doesn't look natural. But here I was just amazed how people are just, you know, expressing themselves and... Yeah, again, how how helpful they were throughout my my different exploration here. I was always very welcomed, and I, w I will. Uh, it will be really a memorable uh, stay for me for the rest of my life. I really loved my stay here. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you for being with us, and we hope that you will come back again to continue with sure. your work here. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I have so much ideas. This was just a frac fraction <laughs> of them. That's great. Thank you. I would love Can we to have come a round back. of applause for Catherine once again? Thank, Thank you so you. much. We have literary society at uh, two o'clock uh, with Ramya Reddy, uh, who has worked on this beautiful book called The Soul of Nilgiris. Uh, please join us uh, at this beautiful venue. Uh, it's an old library, uh, a 200 old uh, uh, year old library. And it's a great space that we wanted to engage with, move maybe a little out of the auditorium <laughs> and go into the beautiful spaces that we have used for our exhibitions. So please have your lunch, uh, get your coffees, and then head to Madras Literary Society. We'll see you there. Thank you. And we also have a film here in the evening uh, today at 7 p.m. Uh, so Let's kind of move around the city and maybe come back here in the evening. And of course, yes. And again, we meet here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for our next round of talks. You can check them on our social media and our website. Thank you. Thank you for being with us.